Hi, I'm Dan Fleisch from the Physics Department at Wittenberg, and as you can probably guess, I'm not in Ohio. That means I'm not going to be there for the August 21st solar eclipse. Since I'm over 4,000 miles from Ohio, I'm not going to be able to talk to you in person about this event. But what I am going to do is to use this video to answer some of the questions I've been getting about the eclipse. It's actually appropriate that I'm talking to you about this from here, because it's here, on the Salisbury Plain in England, that we have some of the most magnificent evidence in the world that for a very long time people have cared about the position of the sun and the moon and events in the sky. Stonehenge was built over a period of about a thousand years. And we don't know why people put these stones in this configuration on this place. But it's probably not a coincidence that there's a central avenue that on the longest day of the year, the summer solstice, points right into the rising sun. So we're pretty sure that some parts of Stonehenge served some astronomical purpose. What we know for certain is that in the three or four thousand years since the peak activity at Stonehenge, people continued to study the motion of the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. And that knowledge had some practical applications. One of those was to allow people to navigate around the planet in great ships like this. But whether it was for navigation or religious or astrological reasons, or just understanding how the universe works, the positions of objects in the sky mattered. And it's because we've been tracking the positions of celestial objects for thousands of years that we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that on Monday, August 21st, something very special is going to happen. That something is an eclipse of the sun that will be visible all across the United States. And even though I'm in England, I'm getting a lot of phone calls and emails asking questions about this event. And so what I'm going to do in this video is answer the 10 most frequently asked questions that I've been getting. And here they are. We'll start out with the basics. Why do eclipses happen in the first place? We'll also talk about the difference between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse. And we'll ask and answer the question, why don't these eclipses happen every month? We'll also talk about the difference between a total and a partial eclipse, and we'll ask why this eclipse is special. I'll then talk about what people who are in the path of totality will see, and what people in Springfield, Ohio will see. Also, a little bit about ways to view the eclipse safely, why eclipses are important, and I'll end up by giving you some additional resources where you can find more information. So here we go. Question one, why do eclipses happen? This one's pretty easy to understand. Imagine that my head is the earth and you're the sun. You're shining on me. The moon orbits the earth. Here's its orbit. And as the moon orbits around the earth, sometimes it gets directly in between the Earth and the Sun. When that happens and it blocks some or all of the Sun's light, that's called a solar eclipse. Here's a little diagram to help explain what's going on. Here's the Sun, there's the Moon in between the Sun and the Earth. Here's a ray of light coming from the top of the Sun, here's a ray of light coming from the bottom of the Sun, and all this region in here is in the moon's shadow. Things are lined up just right. That shadow falls on the earth. The sun is being eclipsed. When you see diagrams like this, it's important to remember that we have to sometimes compress the size and distance scales in order to fit everything on the piece of paper. But this will give you an idea of the relative sizes and true distances. If we were to shrink the earth down to this size, the moon would be about this size. And we tend to draw the diagram so the moon is, say, out here. But in reality, the moon should be out here. This is more like the properly scaled distance. And what about the sun on this scale? That would be a 75-foot diameter sphere 
located about a mile and a half away, just about on that fort right there. So remember, diagrams like this are helpful for seeing what's going on, but the distances are much greater, which means the angles are much smaller. Question two, what's the difference between a solar and a lunar eclipse? Well, we just said in a solar eclipse, it is the sun, Latin sol, that's being eclipsed. But remember I said the moon orbits the earth and its orbit can also carry the moon around behind the earth, in which case the earth blocks the sunlight from reaching the moon. Since the moon is eclipsed in that case, that's called a lunar eclipse. Here's another little diagram to help you understand that. First, the solar eclipse. Here's the sun. Its light is hitting the moon, but being blocked from hitting parts of the Earth. So the moon has gotten between the sun and the Earth. And when that happens, some places on Earth see part or all of the sun blocked by the moon. That's a solar eclipse. For a lunar eclipse, here's the Earth blocking the sunlight. The moon passes through the Earth's shadow. When that happens, everywhere on the night side of the Earth sees the moon darken and maybe turn red. Question three, why don't we have an eclipse every month? Turns out it takes the moon about a month to go once around the Earth. That's where the word month comes from. So, if we have a solar eclipse when the moon is between us and the sun, and a lunar eclipse when we're between the sun and the moon, if it takes four weeks roughly for that to happen, why don't we have one solar eclipse and one lunar eclipse every month? The answer is because the moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted by about five degrees. And to understand that, you need a different view. And here's that better view. Imagine that this is the Earth's orbit around the Sun, and that this is the Moon's orbit around the Earth. A minute ago I said the Moon's orbit is tilted. Tilted with respect to what? Here on the surface of the Earth we have all kinds of reference systems, north, south, east, west, vertical, horizontal, but in space what does tilted really mean? The answer is if we define the plane of the Earth's orbit as our reference plane, then the Moon's orbit is tilted by about five degrees with respect to that reference plane. Now I've greatly exaggerated that tilt here to make the point. As the Moon orbits the Earth, if the Earth is in this position, imagine the sunlight hitting the Moon when it's down here. Its shadow would go underneath the Earth, so we couldn't have an eclipse. And the Earth's shadow would go underneath the Moon when it's up here, so we couldn't have a lunar eclipse. So how can we ever have an eclipse if the Moon's orbit is tilted? The answer is that as the Earth orbits the Sun, it carries the Moon and its orbit with it. And look at what happens over here. When we're over here, the plane of the Moon's orbit is crossing the plane of the Earth's orbit and the Moon can get directly between the Earth and the Sun. Or if it's around the other side, then the Earth can get directly between the Moon and the Sun. So we can have a solar eclipse and or a lunar eclipse when the Earth and the Moon's orbit are in this position. But when they're back here, we cannot hope to have an eclipse. This is why eclipses don't happen once a month. Here's a two-dimensional diagram showing the same thing. Here's the sunlight coming in from the left. Here's the moon's orbit tilted, again exaggerated to make the point. And you see the moon's shadow missing the Earth, the Earth's shadow missing the moon. So it's the tilt of the moon's orbit which explains why eclipses are rare. Question four. What's the difference between a partial and a total solar eclipse? The answer is that in a partial solar eclipse, only a portion of the Sun is covered by the Moon, whereas in a total solar eclipse, the entire Sun is covered by the Moon. Now usually it happens that the Moon doesn't go directly in front of the Sun, so partial eclipses are quite a bit more common than total solar eclipses. 
But here's an important point I want to make. Remember we said that the moon's shadow was falling on the Earth if it happens to line up right there. An observer at that location can't see the top of the sun, blocked by the moon, can't see the bottom of the sun, blocked by the moon. That observer is going to have a total solar eclipse. But look at what happens for observers a little bit north or a little bit south of that position. In that case, you can see over the top of the moon and see some of the sun. Or if you're down here, you can see under the bottom of the moon and you can see some of the sun. So even when a total solar eclipse is happening at one point, partial solar eclipses are happening at the exact same time at other places. I'll show how that happens using this lamp as the sun and this doggy ball as the moon. I'll try to arrange the distances to just cover the sun with the moon. So we would be having, once it covers, a total eclipse. The camera adjusted its aperture there. Okay, what happens if I move a little north? I can see some of the sun. Or if I move a little south, I can see some of the bottom of the sun. The words astronomers use to describe that are that if you're in the position where the eclipse is total, you're in this part of the shadow, that's called the umbra. Whereas if part of the sun is visible to you, you're in the penumbra. As you'll see in the answer to question 7, Springfield, Ohio will be in the penumbra for this eclipse. Question 5. Why is the August 21st, 2017 eclipse special? I think the best way to answer that question is to say, this eclipse is going to be special for North America. And here's why. This is the path of totality. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, I thought you said the umbra, the darkest part of the shadow, was a spot. Well, that's what these things are. At any instant in time, that's what the umbra looks like. It's about 70 miles in diameter. But due to the combined effect of the motion of the moon in its orbit and the rotation of the Earth, that shadow is going to sweep across from Oregon to South Carolina in about an hour and a half, traveling at speeds between 1,500 and 2,500 miles an hour. So if you want to see a total eclipse, you got to be along that path. And the only place you can see that from land for this eclipse is in this band in the United States. Now, of course, the penumbra, where part of the sun is covered, but other parts are still visible, is thousands of miles in diameter. And therefore, most places in the U.S. are going to see a partial eclipse. Even here in England, we're going to see about a 4.5% eclipse. But if you want to see a total eclipse, this path in the U.S. is the only place to do it. That's why you might hear this called the All-American Eclipse. Question six, what will people in the path of totality see? Those lucky people will be able to see a total solar eclipse. This is one example of what it might look like. The sun will be completely covered by the moon. The sky will turn dark, and this outer area called the corona, part of the sun's atmosphere, will become visible. If you're in the path of totality, during totality, you may also be able to see some stars and planets. You may notice that the temperature decreases, a little bit like going from day to night, although maybe not quite such a big decrease. Birds, insects, and some mammals may react to this. And this totality condition, depending on exactly where you are, could last for up to two and a half minutes. Before that, there will be a partial eclipse as the moon moves over the sun. And after the two and a half minutes, there will be another partial eclipse as the moon moves off the sun. Only during totality, it is safe to look directly in the direction of the sun without eye protection because you're not looking at the sun. You're actually looking at the moon. So that's what people in the path of totality will see. Question seven. What will people in Springfield, Ohio see? Since Springfield is a few hundred miles north of the path of totality, People in Springfield and all of central Ohio will see a partial solar eclipse. That means the sun will not be completely covered. Only about 89% of the visible area of the sun will be hidden by the moon. That means you must use eye protection if you view this partial eclipse from Springfield. Here's a little movie I made that shows what this will look like between about 1 o'clock in the afternoon and 4 o'clock in the afternoon 
on Monday, August 21st. 1 o'clock it starts, 2.30, 89% covered, 4 o'clock it's over. Please use eye protection. Question 8. How can I view the eclipse safely? Well, there are two different answers to that question depending on where you're going to be. From Springfield or anywhere else where the eclipse is not total, there's one answer. There's a different answer if you're going to be in the path of totality. But let's do the non-totality version first. As you're probably getting sick of hearing me saying, since the sun will not be completely covered, you must use eye protection. The best way to do that is to get yourself a set of approved solar filter glasses. Here's an ISO number, 12312-2. You can get them online. They're not expensive. Those are the best way. Unfortunately, I've just learned that some unscrupulous vendors are getting non-certified glasses and simply stamping the ISO number on them as though they are certified. So the American Astronomical Society has come up with this list of approved certified vendors. I strongly recommend, if you're going to buy Eclipse glasses, buying them from one of the vendors on this list. Alternatively, you can use welder's glass. Make sure it's number 14 or higher. That will block the offending rays of the sun. Do not use things like regular sunglasses, smoked glass, DVD, CD material, exposed film. None of those give you the protection you need. Even better, you can make a pinhole and project an image of the sun. And some of the resources I'm going to point to in question 10 will show you how to do that. Now, if you're going to be in the path of totality, then only during totality you may view the eclipse without any form of filter or eye protection because, once again, you're not looking at the sun. The moon is blocking it. But when the sun is not fully covered in the partial phases before and after totality, you must use a filter even if you're in the path of totality. Question 9. Why are eclipses important? I'll answer that question in two ways. First, I'll talk about a specific experiment that required a solar eclipse, and then I'll give a more general reason why I think eclipses are important. The specific experiment happened in the early 20th century. Albert Einstein had developed the theory of general relativity, and that theory predicted that starlight should deflect, that is, bend as it passes by any massive body, like the sun, by an amount that Einstein predicted very precisely. The problem with that is, how do you see starlight when it's passing close by the sun? The sun is out in the daytime and you can't see stars in the daytime. But of course, you can if there's a total eclipse of the sun. So, in 1919, an English astronomer named Eddington used a solar eclipse to measure the positions of stars near the eclipsed sun. And he verified that Einstein's theory of general relativity was correct. So, one of the first experimental verifications of the theory of general relativity used a solar eclipse. But here's a more general reason why I think eclipses are important. As I argued at the start of this video, people have been observing the positions and motions of things in the sky for thousands of years, often for practical reasons, but also to try to understand how the universe works. And when you look up at this eclipse with the proper eye protection, and you think about things in space, the Earth, your position on the Earth, eclipses, shadows, umbra, penumbra, you're participating in some way in this great enterprise that, as far as we know, only humans undertake. It's that moment of looking up in the sky and thinking, I wonder. I think that's important. And finally, question 10. Where can I get more information about the eclipse? As you can imagine, there are hundreds of websites that might be useful to you. I'm just going to mention two that I find to be very good. One is from NASA, their 2017 eclipse website. Here's the URL, eclipse2017.nasa.gov. Lots of useful information on that one, including safety information, information about the science of eclipses, 
definitely a really good place to start. Another website I like is from Sky and Telescope. Their eclipse website particularly, I'm gonna leave this up for a minute so you can get all of this down. Skyandtelescope.com, 2017-total-solar-eclipse. But then this one, the Eclipse Resources page, which talks about books and websites and lots and lots of places that you can turn for help. All right, my 20 minutes are just about up. I hope you found this helpful. Thanks very much for your time.